Greetings, fellow Empyreans. I am Ashrothy, and this isn't set up right, but that's okay, because this is the Eve Universe show, but we still need to do the before the show stuff. Also, that's just too dark. Let's let's correct a few things. We'll do some... We're in the behind-the-scenes portion. We've got two interviews today. We've got Seto, and we've got Uriel. Let me actually send Uriel a message. I'm... Uh... Now, all right. How's it? How's it going, guys? We've got the two interviews to do. First time watching the show. This isn't what I normally. I mean, I like. I like it to be a little bit more structured than this. But basically, what it is is I've been interviewing all of the candidates. I do it live, and then I move them over to YouTube. So, uh. There's been 33 of them so far. So I, I'm getting to mild delirium, but we're almost there. And I'm trying. <laughs> hey, Wormius, thank you for that. That sub. You get all of those. Uh, all of the corporations involved in the precursor crisis, the SOE, SOCT, Thucker, Concord, and more. And thank you for that. How do we celebrate such things? We celebrate it by showing us your clades. Asterisk. Clades include Edencom logos, Convocation Empyrean logos, whatever. I, some people have been like super upset at me thinking that like me doing the clades thing is like being upset. I want to tell the story about the clades thing, first of all. The clades thing comes from when I was first, first in like uh, affiliate. When I was an affiliate, you could only have three emotes at most. And so I was like, well, how am I going to deal with three emotes? What can I do? And like, I wanted something that people would want to share or do. And so, and I also wanted to like talk about, have it be something about the lore, but something about the lore that's just a one step further than most people were at. So the clades. So my first three emotes were the clades. And that's why when somebody sub, I, I say, show me your clades. But now people think that like, it's a pro Triglavian thing. And it's like, ugh. but either way, that's why I'm just giving permission right here, right now. Subvert expectations, throw out Edencom, whatever you want. Why is this dark? How you doing? You can say hi to everybody, said out if you want. <laughs> well, I mean, there's a reason why I do this. What's going on with this? I just, whoop, nope, 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 not that. That, that wasn't it. I'm going to have to. My game. Sure. Now I'm just blown out. Awesome. All right, fine. Hold on. Oh, it's this side. I know that this is why you watch the stream, right? This is this is why you watch it live, is to watch me do all this shit. God damn it. All right. Oh, I also had it muted. Good. I'm getting all of the problems out of the way. Now you can say hi, Seto. Hello. Whoopsie. Can I like this at all? Yeah. There we go. That's so much better. Hey, thanks for following me. Uh, thanks for joining us down the rabbit hole with Zeeb Online there, J Caterpillar. So that is quiet. Very probable.
you say something? Test. Well, now you have to say Imperium just to make it even. Mm, no, I don't know about that. <laughs> All right. I think yeah, we're good. I, I know. Usually my mic is quiet. I think we're good. I got this open. I got that. I got this. Yeah, exactly. Okay. What, what conditioner do I use? I'm not dealing with that right now. Yes, I do. What do I? I'm not dealing with that right now. I take good care of my hair. I'll put it that way. You all know I have ADHD, and that's not very nice. We're going to. We're going to do this. We're going to now reset to the EV Universe video or logo, and then uh, we go into it. Greetings, fellow Empyreans. I am Ashrathi, and this is the Eve Universe Show. Continued coverage of the CSM 16 election with our interviews with the candidates, this time with Seto. How are you, Seto? Good. How are you, man? I am doing pretty good. Uh, we got a lot to get to, a lot, and so let's just jump right into it with explaining the rules. I have 50 minutes to go over the candidacy with the candidate. I have their post in front of me and can reference it and show it to you guys as we go. And uh, after my 50 minutes, I give him a 10 minute warning and the candidate gets an opportunity to go over anything that maybe I've missed or points that they want to reinforce before we finish, give final presentations, whatever. And then when they are done, we wrap it up and it all goes over to YouTube where it goes on the playlist with all of the others. So that way you can watch them all and become an informed electorate because that's what really matters. Having an, a well-informed electorate and that is active and voting that empowers an active and effective CSM, which is a powerful tool for us players, but only if we make it so. That being said, set out, what is your history with the CSM? Uh, so this is actually my first time running for CSM properly. Uh, there's been a few times where I've dabbled in it and thought about doing it. Um, I never really pulled the trigger on it due to real life situations and a bunch of other commitments. Uh, however, this year after, um, you know, it's been a year of me, a lot of people don't really know my background, but it's been a year of me where I branched off and have created my own alliance now. And after sitting through that, I've sort of, and doing that, I have have a different perspective on the game and it felt like the right time to try to run for CSM because I, instead of just having an FC or military perspective of the game, I have a, after building an alliance that now owns part of the South, I have a whole different view on the game, politics, and especially the mechanics in the game and how people play the game in terms of creating an alliance from start to zero, um, from zero to go. And I think that there's a lot of things that, at least in my opinion, I have ideas on that would benefit not just the game, but in terms of player interaction and people logging in to enjoy the game instead of just sitting there and not really enjoying it. Because I think Eve, current day Eve, not a lot of people log in and sit there. I may be wrong in this, but I think in current Eve, a lot of people will log in, but they don't really know what to do or will enjoy it or enjoy their play time. A lot of it feels like a burden sometimes, at least yeah, that's my opinion. Well, I certainly agree that Eve does a poor job of helping you know what you could be doing at the very least, right? Like, uh, you don't, if there's something exciting going on, PVP or PVE, it may be difficult to know what, what there is. Uh, often players may not even understand what sort of options that they have at available without going to wikis or knowing what questions to ask. I think with the, I think a lot of the new player stuff that, um, CCP has rolled out has helped the new players, um, but I think that there's a big drop off, and I think that especially uh, with smaller alliances, it feels for them right now, 
uh, and this mostly due to state of the game and politics and the big war happening. But I think that a lot of smaller groups, especially in current Eve, don't really know what they can be doing or don't really have an objective they can be doing because of mechanics that the game has set up, if that makes sense. So if you say a alliance has just been born, two corps came together and they're like, mm-hmm. yeah, we want to try to make our own alliance. Um, the they're like, okay, well, we need to, if they want to go Nullsec, they're like, okay, well, we have to fight for our space. Um, the current way Fozzysov is set up, the current way the industry and system is set up, the current way, you know, uh, someone attacking someone's space is set up, makes it very hard on people if they are fighting outnumbered or undergunned and makes it so hard to a point where it's not worth doing. The defense mechanics in this game are ridiculously overpowered for the defender. Um, if you're a smaller alliance and you're fighting, say it's like a, you can form 20 dudes and you're probably going to fight 50. Well, you're going to have to bring something that you're going to be fighting outnumbered if you want to take the fight. You're going to have to bring something that is stronger than the other team. But with the indie, change, indie changes, most of the ships that would be the go-to stronger ship are way beyond even considering with because of the value and how much effort and materials go into those ships nowadays. Um, I think that the game right now for groups who want to cut off and do their own thing and try to work their way up is very difficult. The projection power of keep stars is extremely strong. Um, the projection powers of citadels that constantly create timers instead of being a spontaneous thing to where someone can own a Fortizar four regions away and never have to worry about a dying as long as they show up for an exact timer when it gets to hull. I, I, my, my big push for CSM is trying to come up with make the game more enjoyable to log in and I encourage people to I want to encourage smaller groups to branch out and do their own thing um, and try to build something instead of always going to join a block. I think that one of the big things that Eve is amazing at is building your own community. If you have the time and effort and willpower to want to build your own community, your own group of friends, your own group of players, you should be able to do that. But it's so oppressive for people to do that in the current game mechanics that it drives people to not want to do it. I mean, there's other stuff on my CSM campaign, but like after building an alliance from zero, I understand those struggles. And I'm lucky because of my experience, the people I know, and the resources I had at the time to be able to make something um, that's make an alliance that is now like beyond like the small alliance. I would not call my alliance a small alliance, but those groups who only have two, three corps or who live in LOSAC and, you know, are trying to get some sort of alliance or corp income, um, they, they can't because they just, the way timers and citadels are set up, it's very oppressive for them to do it especially if like the Athenor or whatever structure they're trying to push is time. It creates a timer. And then those people, the say the defenders are set to show up for that timer. Right. But I mean, that is, uh, I guess pretty much an accepted concession in a lot of games because Eve ultimately, uh, you know, it, there's a real life component to it. So, you know, by the same t- by the same token, a small alliance would never be able to hold a region from anybody with without oh, I, the I, use of timers. I think there's benefits to timers. I think there's downsides to timers. Uh, I think that uh, if you go back and look at the old POS mechanics, there was a good balance in them. And I, I pers- I know it's. It's very unlikely to happen, and it's not. Again, all if if the CSM is there as voice, it's not going to change the game. And I'm not going to go in and be like, oh, we need to bring POS timers back. But I think that the way the three timers are set up, I think the way they've done abandonment, they've done low power, has benefited. But I think there's a little bit more you can do on. Um, you know, there's groups that have keep stars that reach across nine regions, and I just think that that is a bit ridiculous. I I, I don't think it, the like I, the force, the projection of keep stars is extremely strong, and maybe I'm wrong in saying like Athenors and Astros aren't, but 
Um, I think that there's more you could do to look at structures in terms of how you want to set up those timers. Well, I, I've heard a rumor that there's a lot less of those uh, keep stars lying around in, in space recently. But, um, and, and, yeah, and meanwhile, like, like also the industry changes are, are kind of some of that's a temporary disturbance to the market more than, uh, like an actual The change. good thing about the in, indie changes is that they've set it up to where they can scale it back when they want to hit the distribution phase again, or what do they call it? The, uh, redistribution, uh, the phase. Yeah. yeah. The redistribution phase. And I, I think that the industry changes were a good change. I think they made them extremely drastic to drive stuff out of the economy and sort of starve people. And I guess that's why they call it the starvation period. But I think that that period needs to end sooner rather than later. Cause I think that it's driving people away from the game instead of people wanting to continue to play. And maybe when they hit that redistribution phase, those players come back. But I think that the uh, starvation phase sort of needs to be wrapping up here near the end. Yeah. Uh, well, so the good news is, is that um, I don't know what they what anyone wants to call something, but the they announced that the final step of scarcity was at the end of last year, early this year. And since then, we've gotten several uh, new increases in like ore sites and stuff like that. So we actually, technically speaking, are just stepping into uh, redistribution. It, it, it may not feel like that yet. Uh, but, uh, it does seem like they have worked on doing more things like anomalies and sites that they can dynamically control how much they spawn or whatnot, rather than static belts, which are static. But, I agree with them. I mean, yeah. So, um, but what about for like small alliances? One of the things I've always thought about, like, is if you want to be a small group, then it basically, you take on a niche role. And in that sense, I feel like there's more niche role opportunities than ever. You know, it used to be that Faction Warfare was pretty good, but now you've got Poshfin, you've got Storm Chasers, you've got Filament Runners, you've got, uh, or I mean like ESS ra Raiders. You've got a lot of different things for smaller scale groups to do um, or take over. That isn't going to be contested necessarily by, you know, a biggest, a bigger alliance, which ultimately there's no amount of mechanics that's going to protect you from a big block alliance that wants to kick you out of your space. There's no way to protect against that. And I'm not saying that there should be a way to protect against a big block. I, I think that there's so many, if you make a change to any part of the game, it affects way more than people think it does. It affects right. everyone in different ways. And um, I'm not saying that, you know, small groups should never be able to be kicked out or whatever. I just think that, and I agree with the pot. I think Potion was a great addition. However, I also think that it is tried out. I think an idea, a great idea for Potion would be to limit, um, maybe limit the, that there can be one structure anchored per system so that, um, whoever wants to fight, they have to clear out the structures in that system. And then oh. sit, one corp could be like, one corp be like, oh, we want to own this system. So you have to clear everything out in it, the structures, and they have to fight for it. And then they can anchor one, but no one else can anchor a structure in that system. But then you get to how defensive structure mechanics are extremely strong, and it makes it very oh. difficult to even attack a Citadel right now in those aspects. And you see that on a majority level. You see it on a you uh, you see it on a smaller scale, medium scale. You see it on a big scale. It plays involved. But I think one way I think Potvin is a great idea. I just think they need to continue to add on to it. And I think the one Citadel per system would be an amazing thing. I have talked it to quite a few a people about system. this problem. Obviously, like this is something I care about. You know, I've, this is something that a lot of people have been talking about. I don't know if you got that idea from somewhere else. But I'm going to give you credit as the first person to have said that and have me hear it. Uh, and that is brilliant. I, I can't believe it's so obvious that I can't believe it wasn't thought of already. That, that one structure per system so that way you can tear down the one that exists, the one that I exists think, and put up one yeah. more. I think that I, if, this is only for Potchman. This only applies. Right. To yeah, 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 yeah. Totally. Yeah, this is only for Potchman because the way it's set up now is you can't anchor structure at all. But I think that a good way to encourage smaller conflicts and would be a 
the one th- one citadel per system. That citadel could be anything you wanted besides like a keep star, but like or any of the exo structures. But structures. I think that that would be a good idea. Of maybe once structures, because I know there's a lot of structures in Potsdam still right now. If groups, excuse me, if groups keep fighting to take that stuff over um, and kill the existing structures, you know, maybe it's a great idea to anchor one. And if you think about it, Potsdam is a great way to you know, fill them in into it from, say, like, Esoteria, and then gate three jumps, and you're in Blops range of Vale. So, like, if a group wants to Blops on into Vale or into another region, um, the way Potsman's set up, you could fight to get your, kill all the Citadels in there, and then you could anchor your own Citadel in there, and you'd be the one Citadel in there. I assume you mean Vale of the Silent, not Vale the System in Potsman, right? Yes, Vale the okay. Silent, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> When you're specifically talking about Ve- uh, Poshvin, uh, Poshvin it, it gets a little confusing because there is a system called Vale in Poshvin. So, uh, either way. Okay, so that's a brilliant idea. Uh, I really like it. Um, but otherwise, like, it sounds to me like overall you feel that structures are too defensive. Is that pretty pretty much cover uh, it. I, the, uh, as much as I abuse the defense mechanics and almost everyone does, yes, structures are insanely powerful um, in terms of defense. And that's a good thing and a bad thing. It's a good thing if you're being pushed in by a bigger group, but it's a bad thing if you're the attackers and you're a you're fighting a group that's this, they'll form the similar size as you, but they have the addition of a defense of the Citadel. And I think that a citadel should give you an advantage, but I think the current advantages are extremely strong. I think that the PDS and the bomb launcher are, are some of the most oppressive modules. I think the fact that the ECM, if you load it with um, on a structure, if you load that ECM with a script, it is pretty much guaranteed to jam any of the subcaps in the game right now um, permanently. I think that citadels are extremely strong and they need to be but pushed back a little bit to level out the playing field. So, uh, first of all, I, I just want to clarify something. When you say citadels, are you meaning all structures? Or are you meaning the defensive structure line of citadel line? Because the problem is that a lot of people use those two words interchangeably, but yet you're talking about the defensive nature of things. So I just wanted to understand, are you talking about all structures or only the citadel line of structures? Well, like... I guess I would say the only uh, the Citadel line of structures because okay. those are the ones that are mostly used defensively. Like so, Asbels are fine. That's... Sodios are fine. Asbels, I mean, let me rephrase. I like Retaros are like the I think in a decent spot just because their slot layout. I mean, the mods are powerful on them, but the slot layout makes it to where it's not really much of an issue. But when you start to get to bigger structures like Ash. Astra's, Asbel's, stuff that can fit four or five mid slots, and a bomb launcher and a PDS, that's when you start to get extremely oppressive. So, and I mean, so yeah. I do take that back. I would say pretty much anything over the Retaro. <laughs> but so, the Retaro is only there because of the slot layout. If it had a different slot layout or more slots, it would be as equally as oppressive. So it's all structures. Got it. So structures are more, are too defensive. Um, so just on the surface, for somebody who doesn't really know who you are or anything like that, Help me understand that this isn't because your your group is literally named Dreadbomb. How is this not just a group called Dreadbomb that wants to be able to destroy structures easier? Can you ask that again? I'm sort of just confused by the so like there. your organization is kind of known for smashing structures, and your argument is that structures are too defensive. One of the accusations yeah. about CSM is that, like, it, people use it as just their way of, like, getting their, you know, making their group better or whatever. So, so just, like, can you... Uh, the only reason we really smash structures is because they usually end up uncontested. Um, okay. If you're... I'm trying to avoid, like, mentioning my group because there's a lot of stuff I want to run on that it's, it's not for my group. It's sort That's of fair. my opinion on the game. Um what the, I, I guess you would call us that because most of them are uncontested. I mean, I don't know. We went to... Here's a great example. Uh, we went to a fight in Pochvin yesterday, mm-hmm. and we were basically on number two to one. Um, 
and we land we were like okay we'll try to take the fight anyway and we land on grid and the structure we're fighting on has four jam we had like i think eight logi eight or nine logi and we land on grid and the structure we land on has four ecm mids that's how it's fit with a web the web is immediately used to web the anchor and then the th four or three other ECMs, I don't remember the exact count, instantly jam three of your logic. And the way the ECM is so powerful on Citadel is that it's a permanent jam 95% of the time or 99. It's something ridiculous where it can pretty much jam any subcap. So that's instantly three logic gone. So you're already down to five. Mm -hmm. um, and I get that, you know, you're taking a risk being a smaller, like it was a smaller group fighting a bigger group on a defensive structure. But still, that's extremely oppressive. And I get that defenders should have a bonus, but I think that bonus is way too strong. Uh, right. So I guess what I'm saying is, is that like, it, it's a, it was an opportunity for you to talk about your experience with this beyond just attacking structures. But like... Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. So, as, so yeah. if Go you on. think of it this way, um, if, say, your Fortisar gets attacked... Um, you sit there and you're like, okay, well, they're going to bring, because let's say the current meta right now is hacks, all right? They're going to bring a hack fleet, okay? Well, how do you counter hack fleets? You slow them down and you either bring another hack fleet or if you can't form as many hacks as they can, you, um, you bring a battleship fleet that can track them. So let's say they push my Fortizar to armor timer. They bring 150 hacks. You're the one defending it. You're like, okay, well, let's sit on tether on our Fortizar and slow boat to wherever they are parallel to us. So we're in range of them. They get, and while you're slow boating over there, say you're in Megathrons or something, while you're slow boating over there, you're launching bombs at them and spreading out damage across the whole block because it is near impossible to spread your group out enough with structure bombs that are almost always guaranteed to hit unless the person warps away. But that's pretty rare because it's sort of hard to, it's not hard to tell, but most people won't warp away for that. And you don't really want to lose someone. So say you instantly bomb the FC, the FC can't warp away from that grid. So all the bombs are going to hit, they hit all the hacks. Um, and say you decide to engage once almost all the hacks are at like 50 to 60% shield. Okay. Well, you already had an advantage because all their ships are at half shield. And they're not going to warp at zero on you because that includes PDS. Because if they warp to zero on you while you sit in tether, then they get PDS plus bombed, and you're in battleships that are twice the HP. Right. And so, if they decide to like anchor up or move, you have a web that's a 60% web that is guaranteed to land within 300 kilometers. You have a scram that's guaranteed to scram within 300 kilometers. The range on them is ridiculous to where you can't really... Outran you can't outrange a citadel or get to a point where you're so far away that it is useful to be that far away because you're going to be reached by that citadel anyways. I mean, that's all fair, but at the same time, it could be argued that it is a 15 billion -esque minimum boss fight, right? Just in the structure itself. I I could agree with that, but I don't think the the benef the strength of it is way outweighs 15 bill hell tether is a huge strength on its own yeah i think that the, there could be actually some very interesting ways to uh look at changing structures and the way it affects a fight for example perhaps a structure that's in its current timer doesn't have tether so that way tether is not a component of that sort of combat um but what kind of solutions would you provide to this to this that makes it so that i like, give me an example of of how we can fix this while still feeling like it's a it hits its design goals and is the that boss fight thing i think that um uh, some of the changes ccp made with the core etc have helped the abandonment of help i think that the range of the e-war on the citadels should not basically be its complete lock range you, i don't think a citadel should be able to web 300 kilometers away i don't think it should be able to scram 300 kilometers away i don't think that the ecm should be almost 100 percent guarantee of an ecm like jam um i think that structure bombs are way too oppressive but is something you can deal with and pds i mean there's i don't i'm not saying delete pds or delete structure bombs but there is a way five bombs and you're and if you launch five bombs at a hack fleet 
all your hacks are instantly half shield. And that takes, if I remember the minute, it's like two minutes. to. Sh it's like two or four minutes to shoot five bombs. I just think that the output damages from a Citadel are strong. And uh, they're in a decent spot. And this is not like the whole thing I'm putting my campaign on or like... There's a lot of other stuff I want, like want yeah. to touch as well, but I think that one of the big things I think one of the big things I want to push is that, or one of the one of my big points is that citadels are definitely, in my opinion, way too oppressive um, to want to attack depending. And I get that it's a big boss fight and you have a fifteen to three hundred bill isk investment into it, but um, I still think for as a defender you have way more benefits most of the time than what the ISK is worth. Now, it's, if it's a keep star, that's a completely different story, but um, you most of the time, an Astro with a bomb launcher that's, what, cheaper than a Dread now, is still strong enough to make even fights turn, or make slightly uneven fights turn beyond uneven, if that makes sense. It does. It does. Um, okay. So you're right. It, uh, I think that it's an interesting uh, point that you're making, and and I apologize. I didn't mean to uh, make it feel like I was like. You're good. I understand. Uh, I. It was. We were just. We were yeah. rolling on a topic. We it's more. Topic. Yeah, it's more an opportunity to explore the complexity of the situation because uh, the problem is I don't want the viewers to to see that situation and just kind of make an assumption and walk away from it. So that's why I wanted to explore that a little bit deeper. Most Eve problems are so way too complex there's no way to offer an easy solution and that's the main reason the csm like exists because they can sit there and toss ideas back and forth until they come to a good one like no one person is going to have all the answers to this to like citadel o strength right. or etc no one person's going to have the exact answers to it everyone's going to have opinions and then those opinions will be bounced around mm -hmm. um like I bounce ideas around like Pro God and Vili and a few like other FCDs all the time and we bounce ideas around and that's how it should work because I'll be like, Oh, you know, this is this is what I think about this and then they come up with a counterpoint that you haven't thought about yet. I think that you could definitely argue that things like uh webs being able to operate outside of kind of operational combat range might be something that would be worth uh looking into. But either way, um Let's explore that idea of more like niche community kind of play. You mentioned low sec faction warfare. You said you like Pochfin. Uh, can you explore more about what you feel about that kind of play when it comes to supporting the kind of things that you're looking for? The uh, and how you want to support it. So I'll I'll be straight up honest. The I'm no. I don't know a lot about Faction Warfare. I've messed with it some when I joined a LOSEC group, but I never sat down and ran through every little issue on Faction Warfare. But I live, I'm live. i part of a coalition that has people who do Faction Warfare who, who did, and I hear from them all the time about complaining about Faction Warfare and all this other stuff. I It's not something that I had have a direct answer for but i think based off of what i hear from everyone else and that's my main thing being the voice for my group of people the people i'm part of which which is a unique group of low seckers plus null seckers plus small alliances that all combine to a decently sized coalition i hear a lot of opinions a lot of ideas from much people and the the way that faction warfare is set up from what i hear and from my brief experience with it is almost unenjoyable at this point for most people and i think that one faction warfare has been something in the game that's been here for forever and you hear people complain about it all the time and i think people complain about it all the time because there was a time when it was extremely fun however all these other mechanics that have been introduced into the game affected faction warfare and made it unfun for those people who were doing it so i think that the whole thing needs a complete rework or a complete look at to sit down and like be like okay people used to enjoy it why do they used to enjoy it okay well it was fun it was brief it was small scale it was um it caused people to join factions okay those factions no one's doing that anymore why well the citadel mechanics 
introduced were introduced made the gameplay difficult okay well then they changed the citadels to where you have to be aligned with that faction to tether and that was a good addition but there's a lot of other stuff that i think needs to be set up and i can't like i said i cannot speak exactly on a solution for faction warfare but i think it needs a complete rework and i think every csm candidate you're going to run into is going to agree with that because that is what everyone who ha- has done faction warfare before especially those who still push through it now say that it is not enjoyable as it used to be anymore. Uh, yeah, it definitely is the, uh, it, 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 it's suddenly become the darling, which I find uh, rather remarkable having been in faction warfare since Inferno. But uh, all right. So, but I wanted to go back to something about that, which is that it says there needs to be a source of fleet combat that is rewarding. Um, one of the things is that functions like faction warfare, but also more importantly, like things like the event sites that have been coming out more recently, the event sites have been putting themselves in more dangerous areas and the rats are updated to function more like players have scrams. And so like often we've been successful bringing out roaming groups doing basically PVPVP, PVPVE, whatever. So like you beat you do PVE and PVP together. You're killing players. You're killing running sites. You make money. You you know all that kind of stuff. And but yet I find a lot of people that I run into are resistant because they feel that um, you know PVE is is so inferior that they can't even have that be like a component of their of their roam, even with updated AI and rats and all that kind of stuff. Um, do you feel that that's a, a valid way to make things more rewarding? Because that seems to be what CCP is trying to do. How else would you make combat rewarding otherwise? The I think the whole idea that, okay, we don't want to do PvE because it's lesser is a mindset that is a cultural thing. It's I don't think it's a direct solution with CCP. And I think a lot of that comes from things like Z-Kill and, you know, battle site or br websites who you know you get in a pvp fight you have a physical thing to show someone like hey you know i got in a pvp fight and we killed this we did this and then you have a story to tell with it right. you don't really have that and you're fighting other players who then have emotions tied to it and when you fight the pv thing you first saw the pv changes for like where they acted more like players when satios were introduced when satios were introduced they had the fleet concept. They were warping it around. They had scrams. They had logi. Mm-hmm. Like it was more of a fleet site, but that really hasn't been touched on or changed since. Incorrect. Now you see these sites. No, 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 no. That's absolutely not true. So the Satios have not. There's a whole no, new AI. The AI. The no. AI for individuals, but not for Satios. For the past year, yes. the Satio. AI no, no, no you're right. Same. You're right. So Satios haven't changed, but my point is that the events, all of the events that are coming out, use newer rats that not only behave like a fleet, but actually like you can use E-War on them correctly and they, they use E-War on you correctly. Like you yes, can fight yeah, them yeah. like, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree with that. That's what, that's what I'm saying. Sorry. Oh. The Satios haven't changed since Correct. then. Correct. But the, um, the, from what I've, t- from what I've heard and seen, I haven't participated in these new events, but the new AI, p- the people who are participating in them, especially for this low set gate or these new gate editions, have enjoyed it. Um, and, mm-hmm. You know, it's felt rewarding for those people who have done it. And I think the addition of those sites in Losec, where players can also PvP and gang each other on top of it, was a good addition. Making PvP or PvE rewarding is something that is always going to struggle because you have to grind, you have to do PvE in this game, and that's something that is always going to be... You know, no one's ever going to like to sit there and grind. Some people do, um, but I don't think most of the majority of players don't like to sit there and grind. I think that the new AI that they've introduced for these sites, I think adding them to incursions that get run repeatedly nowadays would be a great addition because that would change it up to where incursions aren't always the same exact thing, rinse and repeat. You could form different fleet comps, especially in Nullsec, I think adding those incursions AI. Um, I th- making... You, you could say that making PvE more rewarding would be, okay, increase payouts, but that doesn't really make it more rewarding. It just makes it, you're just increasing payouts. You know, you still well, feel the same thing. Sorry, I didn't mean making PvE more rewarding because these event sites are also very, very lucrative in those more dangerous areas. My point was more the use of PvE sites 
as an alternative activity to make fleet combat more rewarding, right? Like, the problem was is that for years, if you'd roam around with your little gang in low sec, and if you don't run into anybody, you don't run into anybody, you, you didn't have any problems. And one of the things I always loved about Faction Warfare is that I can go into a plex and I will either get paid or a fight or both, right? Guaranteed. And, and I love that. And so one of the things I like about uh, these event sites, especially the ones that focus on something like low sec, is that I can get together a band of... Uh, whatever kind of ship is good for that, like battle cruisers, you know, remote rep directs or whatever. And we can roam around fighting anything that we can find and fight, but also running these sites and making, you know, a couple billion for the group while we're doing it. And I feel like that is the better way to make, you know, fleet combat rewarding to get people out there roaming around as groups and running into each other. No, I agree with that. I think that, um, I think if they introduce that in a way to faction warfare, I don't. It's not. It's only in these new sites, correct? I'm not mistaken when I say the AIs anywhere else. Right. So that is right. a, that is a big thing. They they don't go back and fold the AI into older systems. So only rats that have been authored since the invasion system. Which ironically, the invasions are basically what you're asking for, which is that you know incursions, but with the new AI. So therefore, it's a little bit more flexible and like it's got more flexible comp setups. That was invasions, but unfortunately, after chapter three. Those, those sites are no longer consistent, so we don't get people running those, really, except for, like, dread site runners in Pot. When the Trig invasions hit, you saw an, an, an insane... It was a unique thing, and it was different, and I think the AI really helped with that because you saw an intense amount of players flush to that and enjoyed doing it. And I think that if they focused more on doing those sorts of things or adding that AI to older models like Faction Warfare or doing these little events where... Uh, Maybe not an invasion, but increasing, f making the event s not similar, but as hyped up or as like on the line, like faction warfare on the line as this trig invasion was. I think you'd see a great more amount of people go to it and want to do it. There were so many people that flooded to from all groups of space. You had goon swarm people coming, you had legacy people coming. I had people I played with who would go over there and fight for these invasion stuff. Hell, you'd have null sec bots bring fleets over because it was fun. Yep. And I think stuff like that, if they can continue to do that or introduce it in different ways through like faction warfare or reintroduce that AI into faction warfare, for example, would be a great way to change it up and revitalize that part of space. So going back to the timer thing, if you don't have timers, how do you have fights? You you need timers. I'm not saying I'm I'm not saying get rid of timers. Okay. Um, and I I don't think I think that the I think the three timer setup for some structures is bad. I think that smaller structures should have a two timer setup. I think the way that the days are set up to where you know an exact amount of days after your structure gets hit is going to be um, is a little. So, not, no, I'm not going to say strong, but a little repetitive and I, don't, I'm, I want strong. I'm going to jump. I'm going to jump in and support you on this one. The problem is, is that in the old POS system, neither side controlled when the timer was going to happen fully. Right, one side could hit it whenever they wanted, and the other side could put in a certain amount of strontium into the POS. And that strontium, as soon as that POS gets reinforced, actually, I shouldn't say past tense because POSs still exist. As soon as the POS is reinforced, that strontium will run. And when it runs out, the reinforcement is over, which means you don't get to choose when it comes out of reinforce. You just get to decide, like, how long until it gets re how, how long of a warning you get. This is really critical because the decision of how much stront to put in was a very interesting decision. Do you put in a full thing of Strant to give yourself full time? Do you put in exactly 12 hours worth of Strant to make it so that it's exactly in the wrong time zone of the person who's attacking? Or do you put no Strant in because you don't give a shit about your boss? Like, that yeah, was an interesting now, nowadays, decision. Nowadays, it's set up to where as soon as you get shield, it's exactly a day within the next time span. Right. And that is and something that has been absolutely... Armor. Yes. And that has been something that is absolutely upsetting to, to a lot of people because you're right. Um... It makes it so that it's too easy to ensure that every timer will be in my time zone. I think that goes back to what you were saying earlier about the small gang versus large gang and my statement about like, 
well, timers are how people protect themselves. That's true, but they used to be far more uh, prone to error than now. It's very mechanical and robotic now. It's very, right. you know, it's, and I think, th I'm not saying go back to Strawn. Uh, I think, I mean, I, I don't think Strawn is the answer. I would love for her to go back to Strawn, but I don't think it's the answer. Um, right. I think that there is a middle ground that could be looked at. Um, I legitimately think that Strawn is the answer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not even joking. I legitimately think that they should just have Strawn in posses or in, in, in structures. And when you hack it, it tells you how much Strawn is in it. And that's it. That's what you get. Yeah, you could do that. And then you could base off the. That's but a way to do whatever. it. I never thought about hacking would tell you the exact amount of way to Strawn. Well, right it. now it tells you what's when your timer is. Yeah, yeah. When you hack it, it tells you the timer, yes. Right. But um, if I, I never thought about hacking, it would tell you exactly how much Strawn's in there. Yeah, sure. Why not? But I also want to say that the two timer idea, especially for medium structures, is something that I would strongly get behind, especially as a Faction Warfare member, because. You can't, the problem with structures is that you can't fix the problem with just mechanics in, in, in Faction Warfare space without banning the ability to dock in structures outright or something else like equally ridiculous. What we have now with the no tethering, no, no other functions, I think it's uh, repair, no tether, and there's something else. It loses all of its services when on the final, yeah. No, no, no. I'm talking about. So if a Faction Warfare Corp drops a Citadel now, oh, oh, or a structure yeah, yeah, now, yeah, yeah. in you a Faction Warfare system, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, you lose a bunch of services now. And that's better, but this does still doesn't fix the fundamental problems that structures caused to Faction Warfare, which is absolutely true. And the biggest problem is, is that it just takes too long to clear a structure away. It takes over, a, it takes a week to clear a structure. And holding against a siege for a week w with a structure in system is just impossible. Both sides tried it, both sides failed. So uh, it's it's just it's it's too definitely messed damaging up in for the system. Warfare because of that. Um, but the fact that you ha it takes a week to kill these smaller structures is a little, you know, in my eyes, a little too much. Like, right. Who wants to take uh, three different timers and a whole week time span to kill a Retaro? Um, I understand it on Fortizars and larger structures, but anything below that, it's just like, why would you want to do that? Like, it just doesn't make sense, really, in my eyes, because that's a lot of like time invested by the attackers. Even if it's uncontested, it's a lot of time invested by the attackers. It may not even be worth the time unless you're like just trying to clear something because you want because you're bored, you know? Yeah, I I think that there's been a lot of problems in a lot of different areas of space uh, involving medium structures that all could be fixed by giving medium structures two timers. Absolutely. The AD the ADM change for ADM four, I think that was a good change. I I did like that change, um, where you couldn't anchor anything lower than an Aswell. Um, but I still think there is room to improve on it. I'm not saying get rid of it. I'm, there's just room to improve to make them. Not a bearable is the wrong word, but enjoyable, I, think, I would say. So, uh, let me see my time. Yeah, we're getting. Uh, I do want to ask um, you earlier mentioned Vili and who was the other? Pro God. Pro God. So, test guys, you come from test. I don't know if you've noticed there's a big war going on. Um, do you reach out and receive a uh, word or do you talk to people outside of that side or do you feel that you oh, represent... all, the, all the time? I mean, um, I have friends. I talk to groups like Volta a lot. I talk to dock workers a lot. Um, I'm in a bunch of different discords with a bunch of different people all across the game. I've, okay. I've grown to be good friends with people in Panfam, especially PL um gobbins i would consider a good friend of mine me and him bounce back and forth a lot of it has to do with like strategic and like military stuff but every now and then we bounce around i've been friends with norris ever since the fraternity war and we were against each other in that war but we walked away from the war to where we still should talk each other and send emojis every now and then and talk ideas like a few days ago he was talk we were talking ideas about who knows more about politics and eve and it's definitely him but we were talking about mechanics of the game and along those lines and ideas I could present on CSM. Nice. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, that That's very helpful. 
Never, uh, I, I will say, while I was in test and legacy, I was pretty secluded to only talking to test people. But ever since branching out, my friendships and everything have branched out as well. Yeah, I just wanted to, again, it's one of those things that I I wanted to give you an opportunity to address and talk about. And I think that that's a fair, fair answer. You also talk about T3 cruisers deserve some attention, especially the Proteus. That's a good way to catch my attention. What would you recommend for the Proteus? Uh, I think that the Proteus has very, like, no one, re some people do, um, and it's like a decent solo ship, um, but in terms of trying to, and maybe making Doctrines out of T3Cs, some people are going to hate, but some people are going to enjoy it, but in terms of a Doctrine ship, if you're trying to either do like a small gang or a Doctrine ship, the Proteus isn't really good at a lot of things. It can be a decent Logi cruiser, um, but the capacitor on it is tough. It can be a decent tackle ship. That's the one thing the Proteus is decent at, is the Logic Cruiser in a tackle ship because the it gets the tackle bonus if you fit the right subsystem to it. But it only tackles out to like 30, I think 6 max unless you abyssal it. And it, at that point, it's just better to run a Lachesis that can point out to like 70 because the Proteus has, I think it's only like 10k more HP than the Lachesis. It's better to have that, in my opinion, it's better to have that range. I think all T3Cs um, need to look at. I think that when the surgical strike patch hit and reduced the resistance across everything, uh, T3Cs got hit the hardest. And maybe it was a good thing, maybe it was a bad thing, but in my opinion, uh, I think that And if you're looking at it in terms of a doctrine um, or in terms of, and that's the way I'm looking at most ships, in terms of a doctrine, because, you know, I'm an FC, that's how I look at everything. I th all of them besides like the Loki are pretty garbage. Um, yeah. So I mean, it, maybe I should rephrase. What would you do for the Proteus and why is it give that make them whole tank drone boats? Wait, why does the Proteus make a whole tank drone? boat? <laughs> Sorry. That's my thing. <clears throat> yeah. They should definitely have a, they should have whole, whole bonuses and dro a, a, a competent drone subsystem. That's all. That's all I'm saying. Oh, I agree with that. I think that a drone subsystem would be really cool because there's no T3C that has a drone system. You have a, you have the Tango with the missiles. You have the Legion. You cover every like attack or attack system besides the drones. And I think the Proteus would have a cool, would be pretty cool if you could have a subsystem for it or at least a subsystem bonus. All right. Uh... I, I don't. I, what I would do exactly to it, uh, I think that. It's T3Cs are hard to have an exact answer to because of the way the subsystems work because I can't be like, oh, add a mid slot or add a low slot. You have to first look at the subsystems and be like, okay, what do you want to change about the subsystems? Because it's a multi-structure like structure ship that can change on the fly. And that's what makes T3Cs really cool, but I don't think they get as much use as they should. So, uh, you said that you're, you know, becoming a fleet commander, um, or not the fleet commander, but an alliance coalition commander this year. Change your perspective, which is the big reason why you want to be um, now on the CSM. We're getting basically to your ten minute warning, but uh, I want to ask, like, what is the biggest like realization or or revelation, change of perspective? Uh, paradigm shift that you underwent um, when you went, you know, when you became that leadership position and, uh, that you want to convey to CCP? Uh, I think that the, what I'm about to say, what I'm about to say is not like something CCP can f relative, I would say fix. Um, yeah, I'm not asking but, for you to ask yeah. for a fix, but what I'm saying is that, like, yeah. you said that you your perception changed. What was, like, the most My impactful, like, because oh, come to Jesus moment? Yeah. Oh, sorry. The come to Jesus moment was when I look at – the come to Jesus moment for me was when I looked at income. Income for alliances or corps, especially ones who don't have people who, like, were at, is very small. If you – like, you have moons – but most like good moons are usually taken up by the bigger groups. And that's how it's always been. You know, you go back to the technetium days, but um, there's no way for a smaller group to really 
produce its own income besides the goodwill of members or anything. There was a brief period where, you know, there was very little way for us to make money besides like ratting taxes, but we were a group of people who didn't like to rat. Um, I think that I'm not saying add more moons or anything, but I think that adding smaller objectives, I think the ESS was a great thing. I think the ESS for small groups was a great addition, but it needs to keep being tweaked and added on. Um, because that could be a good way for you to get some alliance money as a small group. You could take a roam out with the goal of raiding as many ESSs as you wanted and pulling this from it. Um, I think that smaller groups, and you know, they aren't, because they're smaller, they're not going to pull in billions and billions of ISK. That's not going to happen. But I think that having smaller objectives for them to aim for is something that could be looked at. I think that you may have hit the nail on the head there. Um, and I encourage you to explore that deeper. And I think that that is an insight that I would love to have on the CSM because that goes everywhere. I hear that in faction warfare. I hear that in Posh, Pochfin. I hear that all over the place that being able to provide a solution to the ISK problem to your membership, uh, is just so big of a problem for so many Alliance leaders and, the issue is, is that ratting makes taxation so easy and such a, an attractive solution. This is one of the reasons why people always, uh, like leadership, end up wanting to go to NullSec. Membership don't always want to, but leadership will. This happens in Faction Warfare and other places. Because when you're in Faction Warfare, you get no income as an alliance. You only get, uh, your membership gets income. And so if you want to be able to provide things like SRP and, the th and things that people expect, now you need to figure out some sort of income. And then you figure out that ratting income is really, really good. And you, and suddenly you're a null block person again, or, you know, or like exactly. whatever. The, um, you know, you get to, it, it's getting to, and you know, you're a smaller group. You're not going to have access to like a full SRP or anything. And I don't think you should, but there's literally next to none until you move into null or take some moons right? somewhere, somewhere. And, somewhere someplace or you just rely on the goodwill of your members like some wormhole alliances have you know it's like okay well if you're gonna go do a site leave some blue loot for the corp and that's your tax but they can't really track it um my big revelation was that like looking at the financial part of alliances especially at the big blocks work you know most big blocks nowadays are in some way shape or form wired and get a crap ton of money from the tranquility keep start I do not think that Keepstar should exist. I do not think that Keepstar is an ISEC or something that ever should have been allowed. Um, and that goes back to sort of defensive, defending that Citadel, because the defense of it is super strong, but we, I won't get back into that. But um, a lot of the risk comes from that, but they also have the advantage of owning a whole region and getting these moons and stuff. It's, it's just really hard for smaller groups to force any sort of income, because why would someone go to your smaller group that you're putting a lot of time and effort into building a community to enjoy doing what you want to do? Why would they go there when you can't offer SRP or like the Keepstar Citadels or anything like that when they can go join a big group who offers it with no worry about their financial situation? Yeah, I, I basically... Uh, and it, it's not an easy answer because if you add a way for those groups to make money and it's inviting enough, you'll just have no blocks to big blocks doing the same thing. And I'm not like, and that goes back to how every change you make to the game affects every single layer. And there, I don't think there's no an easy answer, but I think it's something that never really gets addressed because no one has that voice. Um, yeah. Or pushes that voice. Well, one of the good examples I think would be like uh, our alliance does reinforce carbon fibers and other that that sort of stuff for the new industrial changes, right? So we've got some people that do the mining, and then we have a place to go do the reactions, and then other people that are doing the reactions. So we've got haulers and all that kind of stuff, and so we together work on this project, and we all share the profit from that, right? We also have a T two project and other stuff like that. So what I'm saying is, is that I think that there needs to be more minor objectives for people that live in these other places of space that may not be worthwhile for a null block to take over places like Pochfin, places like faction warfare or low sec you know other things like that or places like even storms like the metaliminal storms make it so that there's cons like clear 
things to build towards so that way the group can work together and be successful and get something out of that and make tons of money that, that makes sure that the alliance gets theirs and the corporation gets theirs. Or sorry, the uh, the players, the, the members get theirs. And we need to start thinking about cohesive systems and what these small groups will do as their niche beyond just like, here's some space and here's some sites that give good money. Yeah, I agree with you. I completely agree with you. Because most groups, would, like you said, what they end up doing is they end up going to null or low sec wins or because they can tax their members and get an absolute tax for it. But meanwhile, events don't give any taxes because it's mostly loot and stuff. Um, and uh, the Pochfin stuff. Like every, it's even, it's just more and more. All of these new niches that are being made for these small groups, none of them actually give an income for the group itself. And the problem is, is that these players don't like think like that, right? You don't say, "Oh, well, you get all the income, and therefore we don't offer an SRP." They're going to just expect you to offer an SRP, and when you don't offer an SRP, they're going to think that you're not as good as the other groups because everybody who means anything offers an SRP. I agree. So yeah, that's a really good point. I'm sorry. So like, but do you have anything else before uh, we wrap it up? Um, I think really. Let me think. Um, let's see. You can keep asking. Uh, actually, no. A few things. Uh, in terms of T3Ds, Jackdaws or the King and the other ones need to be looked at. The other ones are unless you're doing like solo stuff, like Hecates, Hecate or solo Hecate stuff. Usually the other T3Ds suck compared to the Jackdaw in terms of the concept. I have seen the um, Hecate used quite a bit. The Coerce are some uh, sees some use. So basically, what I'm hearing is the Sipul needs to be brought out of timeout. It's been it's been in time. It's been in the, the timeout confessor. corner for for about two well, two years now. The, most of the T3Ds are good, like solo little small gang roaming ships. But in terms of doctrines, uh, the Jackdaw's the king. Everyone's going to fight the Jackdaw. No, you're right. I, um, sorry, the Confessor's always been mediocre. The Spitpole specifically was overpowered for a long time, so that's why I said it's been in timeout. Yeah, oh, I agree with you. Um, I think that PIUI, especially the PIUI, that's weird to say, uh, needs a whole rework, especially with how um, much with the indie changes they want to introduce pi into production of capitals and battleships and stuff like that mm -hmm. i think that the ui needs to rework to make it not maybe it sort of needs to keep the same amount of clicks or a similar number of clicks because you know it's sort of quote unquote passive income but it shouldn't be oh i set it up in two seconds it should take some time to set up but the ui is just very outdated compared to most other stuff um, I think that there should be a way to compress gas because with the current mechanics on building capitals, especially you have to get a lot of gas from a wormhole and say you own a wormhole, but you mine the gas. That's a lot of M3 that you have to transport out with a DST and the DST that's like 20 round trips right there, um, in a DST because you can't compress it. Right. It's stuck like that. Um, and you need it for the current indie changes to do that um and then the big one another big one i want to uh, look at is the whole indus industry index and the reaction index needs a complete rework in my opinion a lot of people don't know oh did i lose you which reactions are hold up hold up hold up, hold up. you there yeah can you hear me yeah sorry you cut out for a few seconds so Word to, word to you said you were you were just transitioning into reactions. Reaction index. Oh, um, reaction index and industry index. I th those need a complete rework with how much reactions and how much other materials you need to build um, to get, say, battleships and capital ships. Now, the reaction index spikes insanely before you even get to the final product because of that, and I think that it shouldn't spike as insanely as it is. And that index is also that index affects how much you pay when you do the final build. This is, uh, that's another really know that that's means. another really really big point, uh, and I'm glad that you brought it up because it's one of those things that like a few people know, and it is a big problem, but like a lot of people don't realize. So as you do reactions, it quickly increases the index of that system, which not only changes how much it costs for you, but is detectable to groups that want to uh, destroy your stuff.
which makes it so that it's hard. You know, it used you know it, you, if you could just go out there and like ninja react some, you know, that could be a cool thing to do. But with it basically lighting up like a, the the map like a Christmas tree when you do that, uh, it it ends up being pretty problematic pretty quickly. The, you have that, but then the big one is how much it spikes up the cost, the if you right. invest into your final product as well. It's just like if if I remember the math when I was talking to a guy in industry who builds a lot of capitals in our alliance, and it was like by the time you would get to the final product, the reaction index would spike like X amount and I think make the price you would pay in the ISK to start the build like 1.3 something X. So that's a 30% increase on top of already what you're paying based off of one capital. And I may be remembering those numbers wrong, but I think the whole thing just needs a rework and look at, especially how much reactions are required now to build bigger ships. Right. Um, I, I am curious as to how much those reactions will move into wormholes in order to do that, um, simply because of the fact that it's not too difficult to do that there. But... I've seen a lot of people talk about it, but then you run into um, a lot of the thing that tears people away is wormhole evictions, of course. But um, because you could be doing trillions of reactions in there and you could get evicted and, you know, that drops and you lose everything. Well, don't keep your stockpile there. Like, just keep. Oh, yeah. Keep don't rotation. keep your stockpile there. <laughs> but yeah. sure, trillions was an exaggeration. No, yeah, like, I, I get what you're that, saying. That's the big push away. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and there's a lot of people that like think that it's spoopy and all that sort of stuff. But. But it really does feel like reactions are like one of the reasons why they're pushing reactions as a more serious thing is because they want to groups to, you know, put a you know a, an Athenor in a wormhole or put an Athenor in low sec, maybe not even expect it to live forever, but long enough to make some profit off of it, and you know whatever. But the problem is is that things like the this uh, index issue makes it so that that ends up not being a valid option for a lot of players. So um, it would be interesting to see how much low sec reaction has, because that's the other thing. If a lot of people start doing low sec reactions, then it won't matter because the index is kind of like lit up everywhere. The cost is still an issue, but to that I say, that's why you do it in faction warfare space where you can have the system pumped up to level five and get 50% off of your reaction cost. <laughs> uh, yeah, I completely forgot that faction warfare can do that fifty percent off. It's yeah, it's funny yeah, because I for years the... those 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 uh those bonuses like nobody gave a crap at all, and then like one day everybody was like, "Hey, look, this is suddenly useful." And we, at any rate, it is it is true that uh when when I was talking about those like small scale goals for groups to do reactions in low sec was something that Aderon did for many, many years in order to make money. And it wasn't until like we transitioned into kind of the newer world uh, with Athenors that we started having problems being able to do that reactions. Because, you know, it's not. We'll just say it. Anyway, anything else you want to cover before we go off? Um, let's see. Uh, not that I can think of. Oh, uh, no, 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 I don't really have anything. Well, I do appreciate so, you coming you on. Unless you have any questions for me. But nope. Well, I, I had a little over an hour to give you questions, so <laughs> hopefully I'm out of them. But uh, no, it was very good to talk to you. Uh, I think that you are, uh, like I said, you bring a lot of information to the table. You bring a lot of uh, the experience of being like a, you know, growing an alliance in the modern age. So, you know, we do have some leadership position type people joining, you know, running for CSM right now. But uh, maybe not a lot of like newer blood in that sort of you know null sec low sec environment, um, and in that regard, I think that you know as we can see as we dug through the issues, there's a lot of insight there that having you at the table when the doors are closed and the NDA is in enforced, like that's what's going to matter because the problem is is that unfortunately someone like you can't necessarily even communicate everything because you don't know what's there until you see the thing behind the curtain, right? And then you'll be like, oh, well, this, this, and this. So to that end, you know, if it took me that long to dig through it and I find, you know, a very good, deep niche information, that's the kind of thing that CCP needs. And so, um, you know, and 
that idea that the real issue with smaller game, you know, smaller but growing alliances is the idea of a structured income generator that like involves the entire alliance in, in a in a constructive way, uh, I think is brilliant and uh I'm not sure if that was your main campaign post, but I hope that that's been instilled into you and you take it. It's, um, I don't, I didn't touch a lot on my campaign post cause I could go on for days. Um, but it is in, again, it's something that would have to be implemented in a way that couldn't be scaled by bigger groups. Right. Because right. if it's something that can be scaled bigger then they just abuse it at the end of the day. Right. And that's where it goes back into Eve. No matter what changes you make to Eve, it's going to affect everyone. And, you know, at the end of the day, I'll admit I don't know everything about Eve. I do know a lot. I'd like to say I've been around for three, four or four years now. Um, I've been from the big block to now starting my own thing. And I don't, I, I feel like I bring a different perspective onto it. And, you know, I may not know everything, but I do know a lot of people and I love to sit and talk about, you know, ships and, you know, I invest a lot of time into discord <laughs> and Eve. So, um, you know, I, I feel like I could always end up listening to me in the voice of the people who would end up backing me in those opinions. Well, uh, I agree with all of that. I also will say that uh, a buddy of mine named Vapor, I I will, gosh darn, I'm, I've gotten a little bit worse about this, but I should, uh, at the beginning of every episode I try, or interview, I try to give my, like, previous relationships, any conflicts of interest. And while, I, mean, I think we might have flown a couple of times but, uh, together, uh, and we've dabbled with working together. I don't, we've never really had like a formal history together much. Uh, but some of my old friends are friends of yours. My friend Vapor, uh, he says, best of luck, Commander, plus one vote for me. And he's a good he's dude. A... Hmm? I remember him. From he was a great guy. Yeah. So uh, all that being said, I appreciate you coming on. And uh, I think that it, you have a very good campaign and a good reason to be on the CSM. Good luck, my friend. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Oh, seven.